right, we've been in a series all about Matthew chapter 15. It's been three weeks. This is the fourth week. We're wrapping up. The whole idea of this series is very simple. Let's go verse by verse through a book of the Bible. Anybody like that idea? Because God's word is good, man. We've had three weeks. We've talked about man's traditions versus God's commands. We've talked about the heart. We've talked about offense. We've talked about prayer and persistence, and then got a really practical, hard word last week. Give it up for Cassandra bringing the word of God last week. Very practical with how to implement into your life. Keep growing, keep pursuing. God doesn't want you to sit where you're at forever. Agree? Amen. If you've been sitting in that same place, I hope that if you missed last week, go back and listen again. A lot of practical ways to get your life in the, in the Lord moving. So go check that out if you haven't. Today we're going to wrap up. I'm leaving right or picking up right where Cassandra left off last week. She left off in verse 28 of Matthew chapter 15. If you do have a physical Bible, you're not used to it yet. That's the first book in the New Testament. That's where we're at. Matthew 15 Starting in verse 29, if you're ready, say, let's go. All right. Matthew 29, or excuse me, 15, verse 29. Departing from there. Pause. Okay. Where is there? Do you remember last week where Jesus had gone? We're going to use the same map up here that Cassandra used just for some continuity. But we got to talk about where there is because there matters. Jesus is just now leaving a region of Phoenicia, okay? A city called Tyre. Now, I know this is not the zoomed-in kind, but just like yellow region here, that's Galilee. Tyre is right above it, okay? He's been in Tyre. Before that, Jesus had been in Galilee. Now, Galilee is where Jesus did most of his miracles, if you were to go to Galilee or Judea, this is Judea down here, the orange, in Jesus' time when he was walking the earth, there would have been many people of Jewish lineage living there, okay? Many people of Jewish descent in either Galilee or Judea. But he leaves there, and he's now gone to Tyre, okay? So in reverse, He's just in Tyre. Before that, he was in Galilee. This is where he performed the miracle for the 5,000 people earlier. Multiplied, few bread, few fish, feeds everyone. This is where he had healed a lot of people in a town called Gennesaret. This is where, when we talked about, starting in verse 1, God's commands versus man's traditions, this is where that thing went down with the Pharisees. It's all in Galilee. But now he's gone up to Tyre, and now it says he's leaving there to go somewhere else. Where is that somewhere else? That somewhere else now, he's going down, it says to, in verse 29, the Sea of Galilee. Okay? So it's significant. We can't miss the point that he started, he's concentrated most of his miracles in Jewish territory. The Jewish Messiah is spending most of his time amongst the Jews. Do we all get that? It was significant that he left and went to Gentile territory up to Phoenicia and healed a woman's daughter. Very significant. And now where he goes next is not just this little, I know it looks small up here, this little light blue part between Galilee, which is yellow, and the Decapolis, which is purple. That's the Sea of Galilee. He doesn't go, though, to the western side of the Sea of Galilee because verse 29 says, departing from there, Jesus went along the Sea of Galilee. But the book of Mark gives us a more specific exactly where he went. Mark 7, 31 says, he left the region of Tyre, came through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee within the region of Decapolis. So as you can see, that purple area, the Decapolis is not Judea, nor is it Galilee. Agreed? Yes? So Jesus now, having left Galilee, goes to Syrophoenicia. Now he's not coming back to where all these Jews are. He goes again to Gentile territory. Now you would have found maybe some Jews living here, but mostly Gentiles. All of us in here, the last time I did a little survey, are Gentiles. Anybody of Jewish lineage, Jewish blood, 
actually in the room. All of us then are Gentiles, okay? This would be Gentile land, the Decapolis. Whereas if you go to Judea and Galilee, you might find a few non-Jewish people. Here, flip it, invert it. The Decapolis, you're going to find lots of people who are not of Jewish lineage. Have we laid the foundation? You got this? All right, we're in there now. So after Jesus arrives, verse 30, large crowds came to him, bringing with them those who were limping, had impaired limbs, were blind, or were unable to speak, and many others. And they laid them down at his feet, and he healed them. So what Jesus had been doing amongst the Jews, he's now doing amongst the Gentiles. He's physically healing people. He's demonstrating his power and authority over sickness and disease. And verse 31 says, the crowd was astonished as they saw those who were unable to speak talking. Those with impaired limbs restored. Those who were limping walking around. And those who were blind seeing. Wow. It says they were astonished. Now, I've seen some miracles. Has anybody ever seen a miracle in here? Oh, yeah. I remember, I've seen many now. I've been just Blessed to have been around like in the room when God does something supernatural. You can't explain it any other way. And let me tell you, I'm astonished every time it happens. I'm amazed at the power of the living God. I mean, I remember the, the first time I saw a, a miracle, actually being in the room, you know. Um, I grew up, I'd actually been a Christian for a long time. I was in my early 20s. Um, had been walking with the Lord, maybe closer sometimes than other. I was just starting to give my life wholly to the Lord. And I was actually in the room, uh, kind of like you are today, maybe just a few people down from me, one row up. There was this lady who had one ear that functioned correctly and the other that did not, couldn't hear out of one ear. And right here in the middle of the church service even, The pastor I knew at the church I attended felt led to pray for physical healing. Didn't even leave the stage. Prayed for this lady to receive her hearing, and it happened on the spot. Boom. Not the person on TV, not some traveling evangelist in the church that I attended, the person right down the row, not somebody that was set up to make a show. I saw God move in supernatural way that could not be explained except God did it right there on the spot. Boom, lady could hear. Couldn't hear before, now she can hear. God does that kind of thing. I remember, especially the first time, being astonished. Like, what just happened? It, does that actually happen? You know, I ain't gonna lie. In my head, I was, is this, did they set this up? You know, is this, is this fake? I had some of the skeptical. But I mean, this ain't no just lady on TV. This, this is the lady is in my church. And I'm astonished. I can only imagine here the reaction too. It says the crowd (laughs) was astonished. And it says, verse 31, they glorified the God of Israel. So the healings of Jesus bring glory to God. You know, that ought to be our reaction. When God heals you, when he does something in your life, The appropriate reaction is praise. When God moves in your life, it's only fitting that you worship him. It's what we should do here. It says they were astonished and gave him glory. Question for you, when God blesses you, do you worship him for it? Do you praise him? Do you actually like give him the glory he's due and praise him with your lips and honor him with your life? and give him the love of your heart? Or do you just receive it and move on? Do you just, oh, that was good, but, you know, it's kind of like you made it happen yourself. I mean, when he does something, do you actually take time to glorify the God of Israel? Do you just go about your life acting like nothing remarkable just happened? Because I feel like, Some of you may be sitting here just miserable today, not because God ain't good, and not because he hasn't been good to you, but because you've neglected to give him praise for what he's doing. 
acting like, oh, that wasn't no big deal. That was a small miracle compared to their miracle. Or maybe you've bought into the spirit of the age. I deserve this. And you've neglected to praise him. You've neglected to give him glory. And here you sit feeling miserable while God's actually moving in your life. It's like, man, I've seen some people like more ready to celebrate their friend's new haircut than celebrate the fact that God's moving in their life. You know what I'm saying? Like, we won't talk about what the Lord's doing. Mm. How about this? Easy litmus test. Are you withholding praise from the Lord? Here's an easy way to check it out. When is the last time you thanked God for something without asking him for something? I mean, think about it. Just like, really, this is not rhetorical. Think. When is the last time with no other agenda you came before the Lord and thanked him for things he's done in your life without also asking for something? I mean, before I wrote that question down to ask you, I had to consider myself too. Made me pause. The fact is, you have things to be thankful for. Guarantee it. I don't even have to know all of your exact situation because if you're following Christ, you have things to be thankful for. Turn to your neighbor and say, you got things to be thankful for. Yes, you do. You do. You got things that you can be thankful for. If you know Christ as Lord and Savior, if nothing else, you got the fact that you're saved, redeemed, called, chosen. He gives you an identity. He gives you a purpose. He's given you family. If nothing else, just praise him that you're forgiven. Praise him that you have eternal life. Praise him that you're going to get to be with him forever. And even if your life is sucky right now, hey, I got an eternity to look forward to that's not sucky. It's anything but. It's great. Thank you, Jesus. I get to leave this place <laughs> and be with you. You can be thankful. Like the Bible says, continually let the praise of lips bring glory to his name. So you have things to be thankful for. <laughs> if you know Christ, you do. You got plenty of things. But down the real, like just looking across this room, I think you have so much more to be thankful for than that. Like, um... Healed of cancer. Spared from a massive heart attack. <laughs> Keep going. I mean, like, seeing things come together when it seems like things are thin financially, God comes through. Families put back together. Kids following Jesus. Getting so much more than you actually need, like a lot of the things you want. You have things to be thankful for in every season. But it's so easy to forget what God has done in our lives when we're only looking forward to the next thing. Oh, now I need that, though. <laughs> now I need the next thing. Well, that was cool, but uh, it would be better if I had this, too. It'd be better. <laughs> but God's so good, y'all. God's good, right? I mean, when you're feeling up and when you're feeling down when he gives you those things that you prayed for, and also when he chooses not to. Psalm 71 says, my mouth is filled with your praise and your glory all day long. Hebrews 13, through him then, let's continually offer up sacrifice of praise to God. Some of your sacrifices of praise are just that, they're a sacrifice. That means it costs you something. It says, continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips, praising his name. Thanksgiving should be the normal heart set of a Christian. It should be our default. We're looking for ways to praise. It's just who we are. Praise comes out of our lips. You know, like, you ought to try something this week. The next time you complain, just stop and praise him instead. You can't do both at once. There's only one thing that can come out of your mouth at a time. Praise or blah, blah, blah. Nobody wants to hear that. I bet somebody would much rather hear you say, man, look what the Lord has done. They might even get annoyed with it after a while. But you know what? Maybe it gets their mind going, oh, maybe he's done something for me too. Is there things like the Lord's done in my life? I would much rather be around some people. Like, Who loves to be around some people who are like talking about what's good? 
I mean, maybe some of you don't because I know misery loves company. I'm asking you a real question. I complain too. We all complain. I'm not, we're not like putting you in no box here. I'm not here to make you feel bad, but I'm just saying on the real, do you love being around people who are talking about good things that the Lord is doing or do you love being around people who are fussing about everything? Because that's a good measure too. It's a real good measure. Where's your heart set? Do you just love getting up in the misery of everybody and being miserable together? Come on, Christian. Your heart set is supposed to be on praise. It's a good way to see if you're healthy in your walk with the Lord. It's okay to acknowledge things that are bad. That's good. Then move on and be like, but you know what? God's still good. God's still good. <laughs> Woo, okay, I better move on. Gotta move on. That's our response. Praise always on our lips. Because that's what we're supposed to do when God blesses us, y'all. That's what we do when he moves in our lives. And spoiler alert, he's always moving in your lives. Always. Okay, verse 32. So Jesus is healing people. And apparently, this verse shows us he's been at it for a while. It says, now Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I feel compassion for the people because they have remained with me now for three days and have nothing to eat. And I do not want to send them away hungry for they might faint on the way. So three days here, Jesus has been healing people. For three solid days, it seems, he's demonstrating his authority as healer. I mean, three days, he did something else pretty significant too, right? Three days, thought he was defeated, crucified on the cross, but on the third day, he's raised. So you think physical healing's good. I want to talk to you about spiritual healing. You know you can have that too. He's pointing to something better with three days too. But anyway, let's go back to this. But Jesus here, he's doing something in the immediate, right? It's physical. He's meeting physical needs. He says, I feel compassion for these people. I don't want you to miss that part. Did you hear it? I feel compassion for the, for the people. So Jesus cares. I want you to know today, because I don't think some of you get it in your heart yet, that God sees you, that he sees your need. And he actually cares about your need. He says, I have compassion for the people because they have remained with me now for three days and have nothing to eat. And I do not want to send them away hungry for they might faint on the way. The disciples said to him, where would we get so many loaves in this desolate place to satisfy such a crowd? They're like asking questions like they ain't seen Jesus do this before. You know, where will we get enough bread? I mean, where could we go where we could find enough resources around here? You know, they just saw him do this. This is the prior chapter that Jesus feeds 5,000 people, and here they are. But their questions, man, like I want you to notice, they're centering on lack. Their questions are centered around what they don't have physically, right? And I mean, they're not wrong because in the physical, it's not going to be enough to meet the physical need. Just not. If they want to meet the need of the crowd, if they utilize merely physical, regular, mundane, everyday resources, they will not have enough. They're right. But it seems Jesus has another plan here. Verse 34, Jesus says to them, how many loaves do you have? <laughs> this, I don't even know if Jesus says it like this, but it's almost like, how many loaves do you have? That's how I hear it. Like, don't you remember? But he's probably much more gracious than I would be. He's like, how many loaves do you have? And they say, seven and a few small fish. And he directed the people to sit down on the ground. Now, I want you to remember everything that's transpired so far, okay? Quick recap. Jesus has come from Syrophoenicia, comes to the Decapolis, enters the place, goes up on a mountain. Crowds show up uninvited. They just show up. They've heard that Jesus is there. And they start bringing with them all the people who have a need, apparently. Their friends, families, neighbors. They all just show up. Nobody's invited them. Jesus just came. So somebody's been talking about what Jesus has done, who people say that he might be. The word's starting to travel. And all these people just show up here. And when they show up, they come with these expectations because of what they've heard. 
Perhaps some of them even come with faith, even though they're in a Gentile territory because of what they've heard. And then when they show up, they actually receive what they hoped for. They've already seen now blind seeing, people that could not walk, walking, deaf ears opened. They're seeing these things. So they've already had their expectations met. And now Jesus is about to go above and beyond their expectations. He's about to blow them out of the water because it would not have been expected whatsoever for a rabbi to come and teach people and then to feed them. That was not the custom. A teacher would not have been expected to teach a crowd and then it's like, all right, let's go to Chick-fil-A. It's on me, guys. Like, that's not, that's not the expectation in this day. But Jesus goes beyond their expectations. How many of you know this is the God that we serve? He's abundantly, exceedingly able to do more than we can ask or imagine. That's the God that we serve. And here, in this moment, I just wonder if the people even realize that they're about to have their needs met. Because Jesus doesn't say it. He doesn't give them any indication that that's what's about to happen. He didn't announce it first. If you look at the written word, there is nothing here where Jesus is like, well, hey guys, don't leave yet. I've got another surprise for you. This is going to be pretty good too. There's, no re- there's nothing here. The people are hanging around because they've already had their needs met. The lame are walking. Heaven is invading earth in front of them. That's why they're hanging around. Not only did they hear about what he could do, then he did it. He showed up, and he is who he says he is. So they're hanging around here, and they've already traveled. So when Jesus says this command, he says, sit down, my inclination is to believe they sat. They didn't need coaxing at this point. They probably didn't need convincing. They've heard about him. They've traveled. They've had their expectations met, and I'm betting at this point they're willing to do what Jesus says just because he said to do it. Are you? Are you? Are you willing to do what Jesus commands? Are you willing to do it just because Jesus said do it? Are you willing to listen to the word of God and do it just because he said to do it? Have you walked enough with him now to know that he's actually trustworthy? Has he done something in your life where now you can look back and say, I already know he's good. I don't have to know what he's telling me now. I'm just going to do it. I've already decided yes. Or do you need to know how it's going to play out? Or do you need to know what's in it for you? Or what it's going to cost you? Do you listen to the command of Jesus? Because, I mean, I don't know, maybe I'm looking at this and I could be wrong. Because the story doesn't specify that every single person sat down. That's not how my Bible reads. Maybe some people had left. Maybe some people got healed, then they cut out. Hmm. Maybe their stomachs were hungry. Maybe they let their desires in the physical for bread outweigh the fact that they literally had the bread of life at their disposal. And they leave. And if anybody did leave prematurely, they missed what Jesus was about to do. I just wonder if we've ever missed what God wants to do because we left too early. We weren't content to Just be with him now. We left too soon. Well, dude, God, thank you. That was really great. That was an awesome thing. I've never seen it before, but I just got to get back to life now. Lord, I thank you that you moved in my life so much. I wanted to thank you for it, but I got got my stuff to take care of. I just wonder how, how many times have we missed the more that Jesus wants to give us because we just walked away too soon. 
Because the ones who did stick around, they're about to be blown away. Verse 36, it says, Jesus took the seven loaves and the fish, and after giving thanks, he broke them and started giving them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds, and they all ate and were satisfied. That's how I like to feel when I eat. Satisfied or filled, maybe your version says. And they picked up what was left over of the broken pieces, seven large baskets full. And those who ate were 4,000 men besides women and children. So not only did every person eat, but they were satisfied. They were filled. They were provided for in such a way, in such abundance, that there were leftovers. Who loves leftovers? This guy does. It's like happiness on day two. You know what I'm saying? Back to back. There's leftovers here, seven baskets full. After this miracle of multiplication, they picked up seven large baskets full of broken pieces. Now, that sounds a whole lot like what happened earlier with the feeding of 5,000. Matthew chapter 14, verse 20. And they all ate and were satisfied, and they picked up what was left over of the broken pieces, 12 full baskets. Hmm. So Jesus, in Jewish territory, Goes in, performs miracles, sees people needing food, takes a few fish, takes a few things of bread, multiplies it, feeds everybody, and 12 baskets full of leftovers are there. Then he goes into Gentile territory. Comes to the people, heals the people, sees they have a need, takes a few fish, few bread, multiplies it, feeds everyone, and there's seven baskets full of leftovers. Hmm. Could it be that Jesus is doing something more here than just feeding people? Hmm. Could it be that Jesus is pointing to something more here than only the ability to meet a physical need? Could it be here that Jesus is showing these people in every detail possible that he can not only supply the physical needs of your life, but that he actually is the bread of life. So I got, let's get more into this because I don't know if you're seeing it yet. So amongst the Jews, okay, he goes, does this miracle, feeds 5,000 people plus women and children, 12 baskets of leftover pieces. Are you kidding me? 12? 12 is perhaps the most significant number in Jewish history. 12. 12 tribes, it's all 12 disciples. We could go through a list of 12s. He leaves 12 baskets full of leftovers. So Jesus shows up where there's Jews who are expecting a Messiah. And he shows up and fulfills messianic prophecy after messianic prophecy after messianic prophecy after messianic prophecy. Then he goes and heals the blind, messianic prophecy. Then he goes and multiplies food. Then they have only 12 baskets of leftovers, just by chance. Then he goes to where Gentiles are, does the same kind of thing, multiplies food, and there's seven baskets full of leftovers. Could it be that he's trying in every detail to show these Jewish people, I am the Messiah to the Jews? And now you show up with not only the significant number to the Jews, but the number seven, which is significant in so many cultures around the world, that, all, that most of the time means perfection or completion. He shows it to the Jews and to the Gentiles. Could it be that God is showing that he is the provision for his people, not only for Jew, but also Gentile. Like as if anybody would still have a doubt from the prior chapter when he goes up to Sidon and Tyre, where it's like, here's the bread, here's the crumbs from the table. If anybody would think that the, gr the crumbs are just leftovers from the table, here he's saying, look, the kingdom of God is breaking through not only to Jew, but to Gentile. It's come to everyone. Yes, I'm the Messiah for the Jews, but guess what? I'm the Savior of the entire world. In every detail, he's showing who he is. In every detail, he's showing, I am healer. I am provider. And I am God. See, Jesus is not just <laughs> a healer. He's the healer. He's not just a provider, Corey. He's the provider. 
Come on. He's not just a prophet. He's not just a teacher. He is God. That's why he's not just healer. He's Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals. He's not just somebody who can give you bread. He is Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who provides. This is Jesus. He's showing it in every way he can. And today he's still healing like this. See, he can meet your physical needs, y'all. He can fill your belly. He can get you through the next day. But he can do so much more than that. He can meet your physical needs. Or he could just stop there. Mm, No, that's not Jesus. I'm going to meet your spiritual needs. The more important stuff. He meets both. Jesus is into the both and, I believe. It's not just this, it's just and this. I'll meet your spiritual needs. Yeah, I'll meet your physical, but let me tell you about something that's more important. I'm the bread of life. How about you hang out with me? Hey, don't leave once I've filled your belly. Come hang out with me. Do life with me. Let me change you from the inside out because you know you'll get hungry again. You'll get thirsty again, but I'm the living water. I am the bread of life, says Jesus. He's the way, the truth, and the life for everybody. Everybody listening, everybody watching, I don't care where you're at in the world, what your culture says to you and what your family says to you. Jesus is the way to the Father and there is no other. And yes, he will meet physical needs. But more importantly, he meets your, phys- your spiritual need, which you can't meet yourself. And today as we wrap up, I'm just going to ask Josh to come up and play behind me. And we're going to pray specifically over any needs you have when it comes to physical healing, when it comes to provision. And if you are in need of salvation, you haven't had that spiritual need met, which is more important than anything else. We're going to pray over those things. Because Jesus is still moving like he always has been. But before we go into prayer, I want to give you an opportunity to praise him. And we're not going to do it through a song today. We're going to let you use your own words in prayer to the Lord. I'm going to shut up here in about 20 seconds. And I'm going to give you a minute or two to just praise him for what he's done. And then at the end of that, I'm going to pray and I'm going to dismiss you. But anybody who wants to come forward for prayer, for healing, for provision, or you want to talk about salvation, I want you to come forward. And everybody who wants to leave, you're not obligated to stay. That's okay. Just be quiet on your way out. He's going to continue to play while we pray for whoever wants it. We'll have myself and a few people from our prayer team up here. So I just want to invite you to give God thanks. And in this, in this session right here, don't ask him for anything. Just thank him. Just thank him for what he's already done because he's worthy of your praise. Let's go to the Lord.